Thank you, thank you. Thanks for uh, sticking around until the last session of the day. I appreciate it. Um, yes, applause for yourself. <laughs> All right, so this session, uh, I called it Java Life is Short. Uh, basically, I'm going to go through a bunch of different uh, tools that I like that, um, that I think make me a little bit more productive and make me waste a little less time. You know, life is short. Let's get to the point and, uh, well, let's get to the point and go right into the session, right? So uh, I'm Kevin Dubois. I'm a developer advocate at, uh, at Red Hat. I'm based in, uh, in uh, Belgium. And uh, of course, I'm a big fan of uh, open source. And uh, yeah, you can see I'm also a Java champion and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, so we're talking about Java, right? So everybody knows our classic Hello World example, right? For new developers, though, this is a little bit of a daunting little piece of code, right? They have to know about what is a class? Why, is it pub why does it need to be public? What about a method? And why, what is a void return type? And why does this need to be static? And why does this, you know, like accept this uh, argument that is not even really used in this uh, return? Or it doesn't even return anything. It just uh, prints something out. But then it's like, yeah, system out, print line. It's a lot, right, for developers to get started with just a little bit of uh, code. So, um, of course, the Java community is awesome, and you know they're also also listening. Um, so you can see, you know, in the latest Java versions, at least uh, in in preview format, there's unnamed classes and uh, and uh, and stuff like that. So we have a slightly easier way to express this. But at the end of the day, you know, like typically we we will start with this, and then you know. A, we don't have to do Java compile anymore. We can just run it, and it will compile. And then, of course, we have our Hello World. Uh, no surprises there yet. But that's kind of the beginning experience. Now, there's a project out there that's, uh, that's called JBang that actually makes this process a little bit easier, in my opinion, and a little more uh, beginner friendly. So with JBang, you can say JBang init some file, and it would actually, you know, init this file, uh, main.java, and I can show you. So if we go uh, and let's uh, start with uh, going into uh, Java, life is short, OK? Um, and I do jbang init uh, main.java. We can see that it initialized the file. And in that file, we can see um, this is maybe a little too big. I'm going to try to make it a little bit smaller. All right, so we see basically the same thing, right? We see uh, our uh, uh, hello world, and we see this little thing here, user bin env jbang, which is uh, commented out. But that actually tells our uh, terminal that they can just run this file as a Java file using, using jbang. So I can actually just run this. I don't need to compile it or anything. Uh, so it's an easy way to get started with, uh, with uh, Java. And so if we do that, all right, come on, control C, there we go. Um, if we just run this file, we can see that, well, no surprise, hello world, right? So this is, a, in my opinion, a slightly nicer way to get started with JBang uh, or with Java. But actually, JBang is a lot more interesting than that because it allows you to run Java in more of a, a scripted way. Um, so you can, for example, also use JBang to create CLI scripts. So it has this concept of, uh, of templates. So you can add, you know, template equals CLI, and then you can create uh, a CLI script. So let's try that real quick with JBang. So you can do JBang init template uh, CLI, and then um, uh, CLI.java. I'm not very creative with names, of course. <laughs> um, and so if we look at this file now, uh, it actually added some dependency to my file. You can see it here up, uh, up top, commented out. Um, but actually, this tells JBang that this is a package that you should use in this file. So I don't need to use Maven or any package manager. Um, it just uh, does this on the fly. So it makes it, again, a little bit easier, a little bit more compact to run uh, Java. And you can see, um, if you're familiar with uh, Pico CLI, it's a nice library to work with, uh, with CLI uh, kind of scripts with, uh, with Java. And you can see it already built you know, kind of a hello world thing. And uh, we can uh, test this out as well. So uh, if we do now this uh, CLI.java and we run it, we can see, well, it prints out hello world. 
Um, but actually, you know, with uh, Pico CLI, you also have kind of that nice CLI uh, interface where you can do dash H to find out, you know, what are some parameters. And you, we can see that, you know, there's also a greeting that we can add. So we can do, um, uh, hello, Bulgaria, how about? And then we can see that, you know, it picks up those parameters and you're up and running pretty quickly with creating a CLI script, right? So uh, there's a lot more you can do with JBang, but I'm just going to go through a few different uh, tools. So I'm not going to go into depth on any one of these. Uh, maybe just one fun little uh, extra thing with, uh, with JBang, you can actually integrate it with, uh, with ChatGPT. And, you know, we all have to do a little bit of AI these days, right? So we can play around with it. Uh, as well, so you can do JBang. You have to use the the preview flag uh, in it, and then um, let's call this our GPT file .java, and then you can just say, uh, "Hey, create a CLI script that returns um, the square root of a given number." I don't know. If if anybody has a better suggestion, I'm again not very creative. So now it's actually uh, going to contact uh, the API of, uh, of uh, OpenAI. And uh, let's see what it created, because it's, uh, it's generative AI, so we don't really know exactly what it's going to generate every time. So let's uh, actually take a look at it first and uh, see what it did. So it used Pico CLI, and it did this uh, with JBang, right? So it knows with the context given that it should create a JBang file. So we see the dependencies for Pico CLI, and then uh, it seems like uh, it does uh, math square root of a number. So that seems like it might work. We can try it. Um, so GPT file .java square root of let's say nine, and let's see. Oh, it did actually work, right? So you know, fun little thing that you can do with uh, with JBang too is you know run with uh, with a little bit of AI. Of course, I wouldn't use this, you know, for production directly. Make sure you check what it generates because it can also be garbage sometimes. So you can, like, say, print a cat and it will create, you know, a little Java script, not a JavaScript script, but a Java script uh, that prints uh, a cat or, you know, create a com currency converter and you can see what, uh, what it does or whatever. Now, moving on to Java versions, right? So I don't know if you were in uh, Piotr's uh, session just now. He asked, uh, you know, who was running uh, Java 21 and 17 and whatever more. So I'm not going to do that again. Uh, just, you know, let's assume that uh, we have about the same ratio here. But um, I don't know if you're like me, and sometimes you need to work with, uh, you know, kind of uh, some legacy projects and we uh, need to run Java 8. Sometimes newer projects, Java 11, state of the art, Java 17. YOLO, Java 21, uh, you know, hopefully you're in production already with 21 because there's some great features, but, you know, for a lot of organizations that may not be the case or, you know, gasp, you know, like maybe somebody's already using Java 22 or uh, the 23 early access, or maybe you need to work with a vendor supported version, you know, so there's Temrin or uh, the, the OpenJDK versions uh, supported by, you know, whoever. Or maybe you want to use GraalVM anyway. So you need, now you need to switch between all these different versions, right? Which is uh, a little bit of a pain in the butt. Um, so if you haven't heard of the project uh, SDK Man, I highly recommend it. It's super easy to, to work with. And you can uh, switch and install Java versions. It's a lot easier, in my opinion, especially if you're on Linux and Mac, um, or you use WSL in, uh, in, uh, in Windows. This works really well. So you can do like, SDK list, so SDK is basically when you install SDK man, that's the CLI uh, command. So you do SDK list Java, and so if we do that, SDK list Java, it's going to list all the different versions of Java that are available, which are quite a few, right? So we got uh, Coretto, we got Dragonwell, GraalVM, Java.net, JetBrains, blah, 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 blah. So there's a lot of different versions. So you could do SDK install Java, and I want to install, let's say, I want to be very cutting edge, Java 23. And then uh, if we tab a couple times, we can see which uh, versions are actually available to install Java 23. So we can see here um, that we have the 23 early access uh, from OpenJDK. So I could do that and then uh, install uh, Java 23 on my, uh, on my local machine. 
And you know, this is going to take a little while, so I'll probably just uh, just kill it. Um, or no, yeah, it definitely takes a little bit too long. But uh, it would install Java 21 on my machine, and then I could see uh, which uh, which Java versions are available, and I can switch very easily between different Java versions. I can just do SDK use the Java version that I want in that moment, and I'm up and running with that version. Switch to a different project, SDK use, blah, 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 uh, and then I can use a different Java version. So you can use this for Java, but you can actually also uh, use this to install uh, Maven, for example. Maybe you want to try out the new alpha version of, uh, of Maven, or I think there's a, a, a beta version even. I don't know if it's in SDK man yet, but of, uh, of Maven. Uh, you can install JBang with uh, SDK Man. You can uh, also update and upgrade your projects very easily. So you can just do SDK uh, update, and it will update all the versions of, uh, of the CLI tools that you, you installed with SDK Man. You can also install the Quarkus CLI, for example. So SDK Man is a pretty cool uh, project. So we're developing our Java applications, and typically, you know, like in the classic uh, way, this would mean we're coding. Um, we're compiling our application, then we need to deploy it, then we test it, and then we need to do it again, right? Then we need to compile again, deploy again, which is a bit of a pain in the butt uh, compared to, you know, some interpreted languages. So, um, you know, ideally we want to just eliminate that compilation every time, that manual step, uh, and just like, I write some code and I want to test that. I write some code and uh, run some tests. So, one project that does that really well, and of course, I'm a little bit biased because I, I'm a big fan of this project, um, and, but it is, uh, is Quarkus. So Quarkus allows you to just kind of start in, uh, in dev mode. I make my code changes, and uh, it immediately uh, makes them available, right? So um, if we create a new project, we can do to Quarkus, create uh, app um, J prime, and uh, it would create a new project. And uh, then if I want to test it out, I can just run it immediately if the internet uh, is uh, cooperative, of course. So we'll give it one second and we'll see uh, if it does that. If not, I'll switch to a different project. Uh, I'm running out of uh, patience in three, two, one. Oh, <laughs> it, knew. <laughs> it knew exactly how long it wanted to wait. All right, so now we have this uh, project, uh, J Prime. So let's, uh, let's open it. Uh, I'll just use VS Code in this case. And uh, I created a little project here with a um, creating resource. You can see nothing kind of special here, um, except now I want to run this in, uh, in dev mode. So if I uh, go to um, uh, my folder here, and I'll go up to the top so you can see it better. Hopefully, it's big enough in the back. I'll make it a little bit bigger. You can just do Quarkus dev, and it starts it up in this dev mode, which means that it's constantly monitoring for, for changes, and it will re reload those on the fly. So it will only do that for the file changes that you're making, uh, and it can even do that for, uh, for our tests. So uh, I can run it in continuous testing mode, and it's running the test saying it's passing. So now if I make a code change, uh, right here, and I say hello from, instead of this uh, Quarkus REST, actually, let's uh, see what happens now. It uh, test is failing, right? Because I changed my code here, um, but I did not uh, fix my test, right? But I can do hello from Bulgaria now, and uh, make sure I fix my test as well. Creating resource test, hello from uh, Bulgaria. And now, if we look at our uh, terminal, it's going to rerun the test at some point, and then uh, it should pass if I didn't uh, make an error. Let's see. Uh, hello from Bulgaria. Uh, there must be like a space or something. Anyway, uh, it did detect that I made a mistake somewhere, uh, which is great, right? So I get that quick feedback of, uh, of what I'm uh, doing in, uh, in my code. Uh, did anybody spot what the difference is? Ah, yeah, there is a space. Excellent. So now if we go back, tests are passing, right? So we get quick feedback. And the same if I was opening this in my browser and I was making changes, I could see this all. Uh, so you know, I, I like this project because it you know, saves me a lot of time. So that's a, a really quick uh, introduction on, on Quarkus. I could talk for days about Quarkus. But uh, another project that I really like is, uh, is Test Containers. So Test Containers allows you to uh, run your tests with 
you know, some dependencies, maybe a database or a Kafka cluster or whatever, um, without having to run those um, already, right? So it basically just spins up a container with those dependencies while you run your tests um, to make sure that you have a database to test with. And then as that test passes or doesn't pass and it ends the test, it's going to tear down that container. So it just creates dependencies on the fly. Um, which is really cool, right? So you can use this with, uh, with Quarkus, with Spring. Um, uh, with Quarkus, you have kind of the ad added advantage that uh, Quarkus leverages the test containers project um, to create these dev services. And so basically, when you add a dependency to your, uh, to your Quarkus project, let's say I added a dependency on, uh, on the Postgres uh, project, then um, as soon as I start this dev mode, which I just started for my tiny little application, it would notice that, oh, Kevin, uh, you started this up. You have dependency on a database that you don't have running. So it'll just spin one up. So it'll just create a container, wire it up into your application, and get up and running. So I'll show that in a little bit. But in the interest of time, um, I'll, I'll move on, and we'll see this uh, in a little bit. But it's a really cool uh, way of, uh, of working. So these were some little projects that kind of live in this kind of inner loop when we're doing our local development. And uh, you know we, we are doing our coding and testing and whatever more. And at some point, you know, our code might be good enough to go to a, a higher environment. Maybe we'll, do, uh, we'll create a pull request or a merge request. And we go into this kind of outer loop where somebody might do a code review. We'll uh, build our artifacts. We'll go into continuous integration and whatever more. And, but there, too, we have some nice projects that help us uh, you know, receive feedback. And especially if we then go to environments like Kubernetes, have to build containers and everything, um, there's, some, uh, there's some ways we can uh, do that more easily, in my opinion. So you know, when we talk about uh, going to production these days, a lot of times you know, it's about containers and cloud and Kubernetes, maybe even, uh, even serverless. And you know, there's a whole bunch of different projects out there, right? So, um, you know, if we think of containers, oftentimes we may think of, uh, of Docker. There's also Podman. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Jib, that's also a cool project. It allows you to build containers kind of uh, from your Java code without having to have a container engine. Uh, there's Canico, Builda, Buildpacks. You know, so there's a lot of different tools that you as a developer might need to learn to work with containers, right? So it's not so ideal if we want to um, you know, make our life interesting and, you know, life is short, right? So one way uh, you can kind of get around that, um, yeah, again, I'm a little bit biased towards uh, Quarkus, but you can use, just do Quarkus image build. You can say, I want to build it uh, using Jib, I want to build it using Docker or Podman or uh, with, with build packs, and um, it will just uh, build your application in a container kind of on the fly, so without really needing to know much about uh, how to build uh, containers. So uh, we can do that with, uh, with our little project here. Uh, so I can just do Quarkus image uh, build. And um, it will, by default, uh, try to use uh, Docker. In my case, uh, I have Podman installed. Uh, so it, it will use uh, Podman to build a container image. Um, and we can see that it's, uh, it's trying to pull the latest uh, version of uh, OpenJDK. So, uh, that's a little bit annoying that that happens uh, during the session because now it needs to uh, pull those uh, container images. But you know, in a second, it will actually have built a container image just by doing Quarkus image build. So that's a pretty handy way of, uh, of building containers. I'll revisit this in just a second so we don't lose too much uh, time because life is short, right? So another project uh, that I find really handy so there's a Docker desktop um, or Podman desktop. Podman desktop has the nice advantage of it being free. There's no license. Um, so it's just an open source project that allows you to work with containers. You can also use it to build containers and stuff like that. So um, I have uh, Podman desktop here installed. And you can see you know, it's uh, a way to uh, interact with containers. So you can see here that uh, we would have some, uh, some containers and some images if it would respond correctly. <laughs> Um, there we go. It's, uh, it's a little bit slow. Here we can see that you know, we can uh, see our containers. We can create even pods. So put containers inside 
uh, the same network very easily without having to resort to Docker Compose files and everything. So you can just kind of make them uh, in, into a pod by selecting uh, containers and then Podify or whatever. Um, and then uh, you can also do like cool things like uh, work with, uh, with AI. You can serve some uh, AI models and everything. If you're interested in that, uh, I'm doing a hands-on lab tomorrow where we're uh, running uh, Java applications, interacting with uh, AI models in different ways, and you'll get to explore this a little bit. But anyway, um, back to our containers. That's, uh, that's a way to you know, easily work with containers. So in this case, we can see that uh, we actually built a container image by just doing this Quarkus build, right? The Quarkus image build, uh, and we're up and running. Um, so let's go back to our slides. And, you know, so now we have, you know, uh, we have developed our application. We're building a container image. And now, you know, of course, now we need to be Kubernetes experts as Java developers, right? So, you know, again, um, ideally not, right? Because I don't know about you, but that's a lot of YAML to, to write by hand. I'd, I'm not so interested in that. The main thing to keep in mind with uh, if you want to create a Kubernetes application is, is these concepts, right? There's a deployment, and then there's a service. So that's kind of the minimum that you need uh, to serve uh, an application in, uh, in Kubernetes. But yeah, so you can create this uh, by hand, but there's different projects that you can use to uh, to you know, make this a little bit easier. So um, if we go back to Quarkus, what you could do is you can just add a Kubernetes extension, and basically that's all you need to do. So then uh, you package your application, and it's going to create Kubernetes manifests for you um, by default. And then you can configure them in your application properties. You can say, I want to build a container image with this name, and I want to uh, have this kind of uh, deployment and whatever more. Um, and you can do kind of the same thing if you want to deploy serverless with this uh, Knative project, which allows you to deploy uh, serverless to uh, Kubernetes. Or you can even uh, use, you know, like Amazon Lambda or whatever. You just add the extension, and we'll create uh, the necessary resources for you. So um, we can do that real quick here, hopefully. Uh, so we can do uh, Quarkus extension add Kubernetes. And um, it would add this uh, dependency to my application. And now if I do my uh, Maven package, we're going to see that uh, it's going to add some stuff to my application here, so in my target. Uh, so if we uh, wait just a second, we'll see that uh, it's, uh, Kubernetes folder is going to appear here with you know, the necessary dependencies uh, the necessary YAML even to deploy to Kubernetes, right? So we can see that same service and deployment that we need, and I didn't need to create it. So, you know, that's pretty handy um, and quicker, easy, quicker and easier way to work with, uh, with Kubernetes. Um, so then once you go and maybe you're working with uh, your application in a cloud environment, um, you need some way of telling your cloud environment, hey, my application is running, but it's not yet re ready yet to receive requests, right? Because you may have an application that has started up, but maybe it needs to establish a connection. Maybe there's something else. Maybe the JVM is still starting up. And uh, so it takes a little bit of time. So what you want to do is expose health endpoints, for example, right? So there's, uh, there's a microprofile specification um, which encapsulates some of these needs that we have in cloud environments. So, for example, there's uh, microprofile um, health. There's also microprofile open API metrics and fault tolerance and whatever more. And this allows you to integrate uh, different capabilities into your application to integrate with uh, these kinds of needs that we need uh, in the cloud environment. And again, without having to create all these uh, complicated uh, things in our application. So. Microprofile is definitely an interesting one, so it works with uh, Quark, Quarkus, uh, Spring, and whatever more. So um, we'll take a look at that in, uh, in just a second. Um, but uh, in the meantime, what happens once our application is up and running? We have you know, de declared our health endpoints. We have fault tolerance that retries rest endpoints uh, when needed, and all that good stuff. Um, now we're good to go, right? We're on production, so you know we're done. Of course, that's not the case, right? So if something goes wrong, 
Um, I don't know about you, but I've had, you know, many times in the past where, you know, you get called, uh, hey, there's an issue on production, go figure it out. And back in the day, that meant, you know, you, you SSH into different systems and analyze all these logs manually and whatever more, uh, which wasn't so great, right? So what we want is, you know, we want to have some systems that generate, uh, you know, that, uh, well, our application generates metrics and telemetry that we can then consume uh, with systems so we can have observability in our applications. So one project that is uh, kind of the, the new standard for telemetry is open telemetry, uh, which allows you that integrates with Java applications with you know, other languages as well in a standardized way with a, you know, a specification to uh, expose your telemetry. So in this case, we can add open telemetry to our application, so whether we're using Spring or Quarkus or whatever. Um, and then we can also add uh, metrics to our application very easily thanks to a project like uh, Micrometer. So Micrometer uh, is another project that you can add as a dependency to your Java application, and now you have, met you have telemetry, so you have inside, you can have traces of your application to go see exactly what happened, when something happened, how did it go you know, through different requests from you know, one service to another? And you also have the metrics to back it up. You, know, you can see, hey, there was um, you know, maybe my uh, JVM was uh, using too, many, too much memory here. Uh, there was a spike there. And we can collect all that information into something that collects that, you know, like a Prometheus or something. So let's now look at you know, kind of a combination of all these things that I've been talking about. In, uh, in a little bit more advanced uh, application. So in this case, I already created it, and this is also available on GitHub if you want to take a uh, look at it a little bit more. Uh, but this is uh, you know, still a fairly simple application. It just returns you know, the places that I've uh, spoken at recently. Um, and we can see you know, like we have a little import SQL that's going to import some data. Um, and you know, like, as you can see, I don't have any uh, databases running on my local machine right now. Um, but once I start up this application, we're going to see that uh, we have the dependencies needed uh, for, um, for what I need, right? So if I start up this application, yes, I'm using Quarkus, no surprise there, right? Uh, it starts up, and uh, you're going to see at some point, it's going to say, like, oh, look, uh, database. Uh, could not find it, so I'm going to create a container, Postgres, uh, for you, and uh, start up this application, wire it all up. And I have a bunch of uh, little dependencies in my uh, pom.xml to help me with, uh, you know, m with my uh, productivity. So we can see here that we have the Postgres dependency, we have the open telemetry uh, dependencies, we have micrometer, and we have uh, the Kubernetes extension. We have the small RI health. So small RI is an implementation of um, uh, oh, blanking out microprofile, and uh, so is uh, Open API. So thanks to a few dependencies that I've added to my application, and just a little bit of uh, uh, configuration in my application properties here. So you can see here, I tell my uh, Open Telemetry where to send the traces, for example, or I uh, tell my application, yes, I also want telemetry for my database. Um, but thanks to those few things, uh, I'm going to have add a lot more uh, intelligence to my application. So if I go to my uh, terminal here, and I start up this uh, application, so we can do uh, Quarkus Dev in this case. Uh, whoa, I already did that. Um, if I now start up a collector for my data, so I can uh, use, for example, Jaeger or Tempo, and we, uh, I start that up as a container, that's going to collect all the data that my application is generating. So let's go take a look at it. So uh, I have my local host 8080, and it's returning uh, data from the database, right? So because I'm running this application in dev mode, it started up a database. Uh, it inserted all that import SQL uh, that, that it found for me, and uh, we can see that uh, we have, you know, like uh, also uh, Bulgaria here somewhere uh, on the list in, uh, in May, so all, everything looks good here. I'm going to hit refresh a few times, and then we can go find out uh, if 
my application is actually generating some telemetry, right? So this is running on localhost uh, 16686 because that's what uh, here I have um, exposed in the application here. So you can see this here is the Jaeger application that's uh, running. And we can see that, uh, come on, there we go. Uh, we have our Quarkus Hotel application that it figured that it's noticed is generating traces. And we can see, oh yeah, we can see that uh, I made some database calls. We can see exactly how long they took. Um, and then we can go and trace it down. If I had multiple services running, we could see, you know, kind of, you know, how it traced through those uh, different applications. I could have a transaction ID to, uh, to pull it all together. Um, so that's the telemetry. Now, Quarkus, when you run it in dev mode, it also has this uh, dev UI, which is also quite handy. Um, so it shows a bunch of the, the extensions that you're running. So you can see here, it knows that, we're, uh, that I have a micrometer dependency, and uh, it even has a little Prometheus embedded into this dev mode to show, you know, for example, uh, the, uh, um, the data, the CPU usage of my application. So I wouldn't necessarily read it like this, right? This is something that your Prometheus or some other uh, system will collect, and then you can actually go and look, you know, are there any kind of uh, irregularities in our application? Is there uh, a memory leak or something? Um, so you can see all that uh, good stuff. So those are some of the um, things that you can just add to your application fairly easily by just adding a few dependencies to your application. So I highly recommend uh, working in this way. Um, in the meantime, I also have defined, you know, like which uh, container registry I'm using. So, you know, in this, in this uh, case, Quay.io with my Kevin Dubois uh, username. And, um, and then um, by doing that, when I uh, build my application, the uh, Kubernetes manifest that we saw earlier gets updated with uh, updated information. Um, and also because I have those health endpoints, right? So I added the small RI health and the small RI open API. Uh, all that information gets uh, added to my uh, Kubernetes uh, manifest. So let's take a look at it real quick here. So I'm gonna kind of try to make this a little bit bigger. And we can see that uh, somewhere along the way here, we have you know, the container image, which it now is tagged as Quay.io, Kevin Dubois. Um, and we have these health endpoints to, uh, to tell my application, this is when it's actually live, it's ready to receive requests. And all I did was just add those uh, few dependencies to my application. So uh, these are also things that you can see in the dev UI as well. So you can go to, you know, if you just run this, again, if you're just running in dev uh, mode, you can see this. Uh, by adding, for example, the open AI uh, dependency, I get, you know, a Swagger UI uh, kind of out of the box uh, where I can see my, uh, my resources as well and I can test them. Um, and uh, send, you know, some, uh, some requests execute, and we can see kind of the same data here, and um, same with uh, the uh, rest, uh, the health endpoints, right? So we have here, is my application uh, healthy and up and running? Yes, its status is up, and database connection is up. Now, what if uh, I do something, you know, kind of what I shouldn't be doing, but what if I kill the database here? Um, that's running in, in dev mode. Let's now take a look back at, uh, at our health endpoint. Let's uh, refresh this real quick. And now we can see that, well, it's failing uh, because of the dependency. Let's, uh, I think if I do Q slash uh, health, we should see it. Okay, so this is a little bit small. Let's go a little bit bigger. And you can see that that health point automatically updated with status down. So if I was running this in Kubernetes, it would stop sending requests to my application. It would shift them to another pod that hopefully is running correctly um, and tells me, you know, this uh, application is, uh, you know, has some issues. Um, so that's, uh, you know, kind of a quick overview of some of the stuff that you can do um, as a Java developer um, to work, you know, kind of in a more um, cloud native environment. Um, and hopefully this, uh, this is interesting to you. Now, 
okay, so we have an application. I've built it. I've tested it. It's running pretty well. Um, what if I have an application that I want to distribute? I want to release it to the world, and I want to package it in, uh, in different ways. I want to package it so that people can use it on Linux or on Windows. Um, maybe I want to make it available in, uh, in Maven. Maybe I want to have an application that you can install with Brew or whatever. Um, and you know, when I release it, I want to tell the world. I want to send it to Twitter and to Mastodon and whatever more that, hey, there's a new version of our application. So if you're in the business of creating and distributing applications, um, that's a lot of manual processing, right? But so there's another cool Java project that's called uh, JReleaser. So JReleaser allows you to uh, package applications and release them, you know, kind of uh, in a fairly straightforward way by just defining, you know, some release parameters, and then you can say, hey, I want to release it. I want to create a release that gets pushed to GitHub or to uh, Brew. Uh, maybe I'll, I want to package it uh, so that it's runnable by JBang or by Brew, and then uh, I want to announce it on my channels that, hey, Twitter. Uh, my application is released. So, you know, a way to get started with JReleaser is in your application, you can just do JReleaser init, uh, assemble the files, and then, uh, and then release it. Uh, what you can do, for example, also is you can say, uh, if you, you can configure these parameters in your Maven, uh, in your pom.xml, and you can say, hey, package it up, uh, create a distribution, and then you can also just say Maven, release, uh, P release, J releaser, full release. So let's, uh, I'm going to try that on my application here. Uh, so I have one more here. So if I uh, look, uh, CD, Quarkus, J releaser, um, we can uh, open this up in uh, VS Code, Quarkus, J releaser. That <laughs> That didn't work the way that I wanted to. J releaser. Okay. Actually, I don't need to open it. I'm just gonna. Uh, I'm just gonna release it. So, uh, to do that, um, I'm gonna copy this command. I'm gonna exit out of this and cheat real quick and just uh, copy this. Go to here, and then uh, release my application. So I'm going to do a J releaser full release. I've already packaged it in this case to save some time. So I compile it down to a native binary. And now I want to release this, uh, this uh, Linux package. So we can see that it's going to do a release to my GitHub. So you can see uh, K Dubois Quarkus J releaser. And it's going to upload the file, my alpha release, uh, push the tar gzip file. And then in just a second, we can see that uh, the release will happen. And I want to announce it to the world. I want to announce it to uh, Mastodon that I've created a, a new version, which is also going to happen because I've defined it in my pom.xml. Uh, so um, let's try to take, uh, OK. So here we see that uh, our um, distribution has been pushed, and we're Mastodon tooting. Uh, Quarkus J releaser has been released. So let's go take a look at, uh, at Mastodon. So uh, if, you're, if you have a Mastodon account, you can also go see it. We can see that Kevin Dubois just posted that a Quarkus J releaser has been released in the github.com slash kdubois uh, Quarkus J releaser. And here we can see in GitHub, we have created a new release. And the changelog would have all the commits that I've made uh, in this case. Well, not very many, right? Uh, and then we'd like to thank the following people for their contributions. Yay, good job, Kevin. <laughs> Uh, and we can see all the assets. So it packages up the application, makes a, a release very easily. So that's uh, JReleaser, cool uh, little project for releasing uh, software. So um, we, this was kind of a whirlwind, right? We went through a lot of uh, content, a lot of different uh, projects. So we started out with uh, JBang, which allowed us to create uh, Java applications, create CLI scripts with, uh, with Java. Uh, very easily. So, you know, this is something that you can use, especially if you want to create, you know, simple self-contained uh, Java applications. So you can put all the dependencies in the comments and it will uh, use those uh, for its packaging manager. So you don't need 
Uh, Maven or Gradle uh, files to, to handle those dependencies. They're right in your, in your file. So it's so an easy way to uh, create you know, kind of self-contained scripts with uh, Java. Then we moved on to SDK Man, and we saw how we can install different versions of Java and switch between them and even install uh, you know, Maven and everything. Uh, we saw you know, quite a bit of Quarkus. Uh, a lot of the things that I showed are pr uh, perfectly uh, possible with, uh, with Spring or with uh, your favorite stack as well, of course. Um, we looked at containers and we saw a little bit of Podman desktop. Um, well, I didn't uh, show the application deployed on OpenShift, but yeah, if you want to see that, you can uh, always ask me. Uh, we looked at micrometer and open telemetry for uh, tracing and for uh, looking at our metrics and our telemetry, and we saw that microprofile is an interesting specification, so this is a cross um, vendor specification to make a standardized way of how to expose your health endpoints, how do you expose your APIs, uh, and all that stuff. So definitely, you know, we try to stick to standards. That makes it, you know, a lot more easy for us to transfer our skills between different stacks. Um, so a little uh, shout out for tomorrow. If you're if you're around tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., I'm doing a hands-on lab to build uh, a Java, uh, Java applications with Quarkus where we're going to integrate with, uh, with um, AI. So we're going to do some prompting, but we're also going to go further uh, integrating with uh, function calling and uh, creating an intelligent application. Yes, we will build uh, a uh, chatbot, of course. Um, so if you're interested in this, it's actually very easy to do. So you know, just uh, join that session. You'll, uh, you'll find out about that. And then, um, yeah, our um, team and uh, the program that I work with, uh, we write quite a, b a few books as well. Um, and then uh, our employer is nice enough to sponsor those books uh, as well as some other books and make them available for free to download, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. So if you're interested, there's uh, a, a few more books. There's also a uh, serverless Java book that I'm writing that should be there uh, in not too long. Um, and you should be able to download those uh, for free um, using that uh, link. And um, yeah, if you want to try uh, OpenShift Sandbox, you can do that too. So there's a link to the slides where you can find all these projects. So on each slide, I put a link underneath that uh, shows some sample codes that you can use to try out what I was doing or you know, maybe to get a little bit more information. And then um, if you have any questions, uh, I'd love to hear your feedback, and if you have questions, you want to find out, hey, how did you do that again with JReleaser, or how does that work with uh, OpenTelemetry, uh, definitely ping me on any of these channels. I'm uh, happy to answer. Um, I also try to uh, create some uh, YouTube videos where I go into some of these, uh, some of these topics. Um, so, you know, you're always welcome to, uh, to reach out. And uh, with that, I thank you, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day, and hopefully somebody of you will win the raffle that's coming up.